Hey guys, I'm back with uh, Ben and Glenn for another uh, podcast and video podcast. We're going to do today's on running. They also do a running course um, along with the HIP course, um, which is on a recent podcast. So if you haven't seen that, go and check that out. Um, the running course they do, uh, we've talked about before a few years ago, so it'd be interesting to have a look, another chat today and see see where they are really. So um, thank you for being on the podcast again, guys. Thanks, Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Um, so I guess if we if we kind of crack on, so what... I think firstly just to sort of set set the scene really what are the common kind of running injuries that you encounter sort of in practice and that you cover like during the courses most uh, the the population I deal with is uh, recreational runners sort of starting from anywhere from 5k up to ma- marathon ultra marathon so but majority of uh, about 80 to 90 percent are overuse injuries so usually they can't retell a particular uh, incident they had it for a while it's become sort of awesome. odd, uh, traumatic ones like a trail runner you know, sprain the ankle or hit by a bike or something like that. But majority are usually, you know, repetitive overuse injuries. And if you look at the stats as well as literature as well as from a clinical practice, I would say the majority, 40 to 50 percent, is knee related. So your classical patellar femoral pain, mm-hmm. your ITB, uh, fat pad impingement, uh, or somebody with a pre-existing knee OA flare-up of those things. So very rare to see ACL or traumatic type menis- meniscal pathology. Mm-hmm. The next big one is obviously the tendinopathy group. So looking into your Achilles, okay, um, gluteal tendinopathy, proximal, so overuse. Uh, again, you, s- you see that more in the 40 plus population. We are seeing more and more people in the 40s and 50s because the largest growing segment uh, in running is the 40 plus female group as well. So we're seeing a lot of that. Mm-hmm. And let's not forget the foot and ankle, mm-hmm. you know, plantar fasciitis, uh, your metatarsal uh, pain, all mm-hmm. those sort of groups. It's very rare to see a true hip pathology coming from running. Usually running is heavy on your knees and foot and ankle. By the time it, it comes to your hip and back, it's dissipated. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit more, we don't really see true hips from there. So majority will be knee and foot and ankle, and obviously your tendinopathy. So those are the big ones which we see uh, and which we also cover on our courses as well. Okay, cool. And how do you go about screening people or screening people with running injuries? And what you know, how what do you use with that information? Or how do you use that information? Mm-hmm. So um, we've got a nice little system that we do with run the screen where we look at um, how they move first of all I think that's really important so um, the uh, functional movement tests have had a bit of a, a bit of a kind of hard time lately but I still I still use them for my runners I think it gives you a lot of useful information obviously you can't take that information and predict injury risk and things like that but it can uh, very nicely direct your the rest of your assessment and your initial rehab exercises and stuff like that so I'll look at I'll, I'll look at an overhead squat I'll look at a, a good overview of their whole kinetic chain I'll look at single leg squat um, I'll, from that you can see if they've got any you know apparent weaknesses around the hip if they're going into valgus that kind of that kind of stuff um, I still use uh, a lot of dynamic differentiation tests and we still use those on our courses as well so from our um, three main um, objective tests which are uh, functional movement testing which is your overhead squat your single leg squat and um, hop testing uh, from that, we can then direct and use one of seven dynamic differentiation tests to focus more on if we think it's a thoracic mobility issue, for example, or if we think it's a um, restriction of dorsiflexion. We can then explore that further without having to to stop the test. You know, um, so it kind of takes you away from a lot of static uh, measurements. But obviously, part of our screening will still look at certain specific static measurements. So I think you need to have a good way of looking at hip extension um, I think you need to be looking at ankle dorsiflexion um, great toe ex- extension as well um, so there are certain static markers that are really relevant for all runners and those three in particular would be part of my screen and then you want to look at uh, muscle strength muscle um, endurance testing stuff like that so there's a variety of ways that you can do that you know um, uh, we're using handheld dynamometers a lot more now um, but I'm also a big advocate of getting my runners to self-test you know so I'll teach them how in a gym environment they can look at their 10 rep maxes of of quads and hamstrings and workout ratios of that Mm -hmm. looking at single leg leg press you know looking at what their their squat um, numbers are and things like that so I'm a big advocate of that as well so um, finally then you you might choose to look at them run you know so run in analysis Mm -hmm. Um, that for me is the special test of a runner Um, so uh, putting it all into practice really if someone's getting pain when they stand up from sitting you're going to watch that aren't they if someone's yeah. getting pain when they squat likewise if someone's getting pain when they run mm-hmm. you're going to have to look at that also yes yeah. cool and are there, are there particular themes or common themes that you've picked up over the last sort of eight years of, of working with runners yeah I think the first thing is uh, nearly all of runners who comes 
to us with injuries. I think the first thing I would say to any therapist uh, dealing with runners is to understand uh, the jargon, you know, when, when somebody says, you know, like a fartlek training, tempo training. So I think is really understand from where they're coming from and also what, what drives them to run. So one of the key questions which I ask my runners is, what do you miss the most when you don't run? So uh, many, some run for weight loss. Some majority of my patients in the city run for purely for stress relief mm-hmm. because they work in a very stressful environment. Mm-hmm. Some run while in a social groups. So I think we need to know what drives them to running uh, because if we don't understand them, how can we tailor it to do that? Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, I want to really uh, understand the person behind the runner mm-hmm. uh, because once we can connect them better and also I'll try to throw in words on the first sessions thinking like, are you preparing for a marathon? What's your PB? What's your cadence? So immediately the first thing they ask me is, are you a runner? So we want to really create, create the connection on mm-hmm. the first session that you do understand running. So first thing most runners look out for uh, when they deal with therapists is, does this therapist understand running? Mm-hmm. You don't need to be a runner at all, but you need to understand from where they're coming from, uh, both from a training point of view, as well as from a psychological point of view as well. Mm-hmm. And the themes, well, we, oh, that's quite interesting dealing with runners. This is something which we see a common pattern for all these years. First thing is, is too much too soon, too fast, very yeah. common. Somebody's running two days now, doing five days. Somebody's done 20 miles, doing 40 miles. So you see there's a big leap in their uh, training profile as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the second thing is people rush back to running after incomplete rehab. They get back with 60% better, 70% better. Mm-hmm. They don't take them all the way from strength training to plyometrics to return to running. So it's having that face manner. They mm-hmm. go to physio, get the pain under control and then they're back to the same mileage, yeah. so incomplete rehab. The third thing is, sometimes there's nothing wrong with their training or with their rehab. Sometimes it's just a massive change in the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So the new baby, partner had a baby, or they're just commuting three hours each way, or, or they're just having other stress relief, they're not sleeping. Mm-hmm. So the key questions I ask them is change their lifestyle. You know? So uh, the top questions I would ask is, is there any change in your training load, intensity, issues, anything? Usually there's always a trigger, external mm-hmm. trigger. And the second thing is, have we had any recent injuries, especially in the last 12 months? Mm-hmm. And has there been any change in your lifestyle? It is very rare in my experience to find a runner without uh, a problem in one of those three coming with injury. Mm-hmm. So it's looking at the mm-hmm. factors as well as extrinsic factors uh, because uh, that's usually the combination of those two. And the running injuries are usually multifactorial. We're not going to say like because you've got tight ankle, you're going to get injured. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not as simple as that, isn't it? Your training load looking at the person yeah. and also the lifestyle. So it's more holistic. That's something which we focus more on. Yeah, and I think one thing I've always always noticed is that a lot of runners who come in just run and they don't do any strength stuff. So what you know, why do, why do you think this is? Why do you think so many, so many runners don't do strength training? Um, and how would you sort of tailor that, the strength training to be specific to them so they can actually kind of get, get on board and, and do what you're asking them to do? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I mean, um, that's actually how I first started getting involved treating runners. So on my background, I'm not a runner. Um, my background is more in gym environment, strength and conditioning. And I started to see it in the city a lot of marathon runners um, that were running for stress relief and um, started picking up on a lot of weaknesses that they had in similar areas. A lot of them had, you know, just their general strength wasn't where it should be for the demands that they were placing on their bodies. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, it's a good question. Why don't runners do strength and conditioning? I mean, you could flip that, couldn't you, and say, why why don't guys that lift heavy weights in the gym do a lot of endurance running? I think mm. people do what they, what they like to do and what they enjoy doing. And if you like being outside and um, and running in the in nature, then you're probably not going to like being stuck in the gym doing lots of weight training. So I think that's the first point: is that we all kind of gravitate towards what we enjoy yeah. and try and spend more and more time doing that, rather than perhaps what might facilitate us to be able to do that injury free. Mm. Um, so the next part was how would I tailor that mm. strength training? So first of all, I think highlighting to them the importance of it. So it's not just oh I like strength training, I want you to do it. It's um, um, you know informing them of the fact that if they incorporate strength training twice a week into their program in a balanced way, that it's probably going to reduce their injury risk by about fifty percent. So um, most runners are very keen to keep running and to do so injury free. So that in itself is a big buy-in normally. Mm. Uh, how do I make it runner specific? Um, showing them this again is where I think the functional movement tests have their value. If you show someone that they're completely unstable on one leg because of a, you know weakness or their hips are dropping because of the hip weakness, then they're much more likely to be compliant with hip strengthening exercises, for example, that you mm. then give them because um, they can they can 
relate that to their meaningful task, which is running. Yeah. Um, I'll make a lot of my strength and conditioning exercises on one leg, you know, single leg work, mm-hmm. single leg deadlifts, single leg squats, things like that, um, so that it is more specific to the, the task of running, which is a uh, one or, or no leg activity, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, and if they are really adamant that they don't like gyms and they won't um, commit to that, then we can tailor it around them so we can give them kettlebells and um, they can spend a bit of money and, and buy some dumbbells, kettlebells, barbells for home, uh, bands, uh, medicine balls, things like that. So there mm-hmm. are ways and means of adapting. I, I think anyone can do a good strength and conditioning program um, in a gym or at home. I'm a bit more biased to the gym, I think particularly for strength. Um, there's certain things in the gym that you can't replicate at home. Mm-hmm. But if you're looking at a marathon runner, which is pr- predominantly what I see, uh, if you wanted to focus more on the endurance side of things, then that can easily be done at home with bands mm. and with, with you know all kinds of um, cheap and easily accessible equipment. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And what and what do you find? What do you guys find are the common kind of clinical challenges that that um, physios face when they're dealing with running type injuries? I think the key thing is we all have a bias. So like we openly say that we are strength and conditioning bias. But when we look at runner, it's understanding the complexity of three, four key areas. So one is looking into the training load. You know. So uh, first is understanding that you only get in running injuries by running. So you have to take a detailed history there. Mm-hmm. So how many days are they training? Uh, what type of training? Preparing for an event. So a detailed uh, history on the training load is crucial. Mm-hmm. The second thing is looking at the person. You know, what is their experience? We know that novice runners are around three to four times high risk of getting injured. Than, and then uh, female runners are slightly more to get knee pain. So mm-hmm. we need to know the demographics as well, you know, what's their specific impairments, what mm-hmm. impairments they have, their experience, what's the previous injury history, uh, the psychosocial profile, you know, all those sort of things. So looking at the runner as a person. And the third thing is looking at the running mechanics. So looking at uh, are they optimized the cadence, overstride, all those sort of factors there. So I think the difficult part dealing with as most a new grad physio is to look in isolation. Or just saying, oh, you got weak glutes, so you're getting knee pain. It's not as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Uh, or you're running too much, you're not getting... I've, I've, I've lost count of many runners who run six days, seven days, don't get injured. Mm-hmm. How do you explain that? Mm-hmm. So uh, they don't do any strength and conditioning. So yeah. they're always people. So it's looking at the person. Uh, so in the courses, we put that into these three blocks. Eh? The training load, uh, looking at the person, both physical as well as psychosocial. Mm-hmm. The third is looking at their running mechanics. So I think the most hardest thing as a therapist knowing what is the key contributing factor. Some people, they just run too much. They have to reduce as, sim- as simple as that. Yeah. Uh, giving the best strength and conditioning will not help that. Mm-hmm. Some people are just tailoring a small little, for example, a cadence is not all you need. Mm-hmm. So it's not in having this recipe uh, doing everybody who works in needs a strength and conditioning program. That was the way I used to treat before. Now we don't do that. Mm-hmm. So it's knowing yeah, which of the three is the most significant uh, for the runner sitting in front of you sure. and then adapting that I think I think for a novice or somebody who doesn't understand running that can be very challenging mm. uh, and not everybody needs exercise so some people just tinker, uh, tinkering their training volume is all you need yeah so just somebody with a knee pain uh, who's making the transition from 10k just reduce them for four days to three days slightly increase the cadence few changes that's all they needed for mm. reducing the pain mm. so n- uh, not everybody needs to be going to the gym and loading them uh, necessarily but it's knowing which one to push and which one to back up. You know? So th- I think that's the tricky bit there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and talked about strength training. Are there are there other kind of you know what other forms of training do you do with runners? Are po- you know are p- other part from strength and conditioning stuff? Yeah, the, stuff. there's a few key areas of work. You know, so um, we tend to do more dynamic core. We're looking at hip mobility is really key. So getting a lot of hip. Uh, mobility into it, dynamic warm-ups as well. Plyometrics is a huge one, yeah, and this, again, plyometrics, if done well, um, will increase performance and will reduce injury risk, you know, but it must be one of the more common reasons that people come through my doors when it's not done well, you know, so, um, you know, your typical kind of slightly overweight, uh, and this is where the argument for strength training is, is key, really. You can't really go on to apply metrics without a good base of strength. Mm. So I see a lot of runners that have read an article in Runner's World or something, plyometrics will help your performance. So then they start doing all of these um, plyometric programs, never done any strength and conditioning in their life, and then they're, they're turning up with tendon problems mm. and joint problems. You know, I'm sure you've seen that as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, plyometrics, uh, we, we teach on the course. We're big advocates of them. I think they're very useful for a runner but they have to be done in the right way and you have to screen for them and even 
um, in my caseload, I've had issues where I've flared people up by bringing plyometrics in when I thought it was okay to do so, but I've put it in too soon. Mm. So we take a very cautious approach in screening for that and making sure they're ready to do it. Um, so they're the, they're the kind of key areas around the strength and conditioning that we, yeah. that we add in. Cool, and you mentioned their flare up. So when you've got people who are say, have been flared up or are acute, you know, have acute pain. Maybe they they're struggling to load heavy. Mm. Is there any other ways that you guys use, or any things you do to sort of induce hypertrophy gains yeah. or strength gains without you know heavy yeah. loads? That's yeah, of. that's quite a difficult one, especially when you want to get that strength gain. So one of the things which before I go into that topic is uh, we always try to encourage our uh, injured runners to cross train. Mm -hmm. We know there's analgesic effect with uh, aerobic activity, mm -hmm. so get them on the pool, get them on the cross trainer, get a bit of uh, buzz from their norfins, mm -hmm. so they feel like they're doing something. Runners want to do something. Yeah. So uh, so you want to really encourage a bit of cross training, upper body workout and things like that. So the most common by far which we see in the clinic is a knee related pain. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is something which I've done my own personal experience, multiple surgeries on my knee about seven, eight, eight years ago. I struggled with heavy loads. So post-operatively, um, uh, I started using occlusion training, mm -hmm. blood flow restriction training, yeah. and fortunately, we got very good evidence with multiple RCTs coming in the last two three years. So it's pretty. We got specific protocol which we go on our course, uh, which we use with patellofemoral pain. It can be also be used for post ACL as well, mm -hmm. or somebody with an EOA. So the things we use is uh, uh, occlusion training, especially knee specific. Uh, we also have been playing around with some uh, neuromuscular stimulation as well to get that cord inhibition there. Mm -hmm. So it's early recruitment and uh, the best thing about uh, occlusion training is you're going to get that hypertrophic gains with only 20 to 30% of your uh, rep max mm -hmm. to get the same benefits with 70%. Yeah. So, uh, but again, there's a lot of uh, precautions, uh, do's and don'ts, what are the pressures, a lot of technical areas which you go through. Mm -hmm. Don't something you can just put it on anyone. Yeah, and sure. they get a clot or something, then you'll be in trouble. So it's knowing those sort of areas. So again, with an injured runner, you can still do a lot uh, of uh, you know graded uh, exposure. And we know that there's effects with contra contralateral training. Mm -hmm. So if you've got an injured uh, left side, if you do strength training on the right, you're going to get some strength gains as well, yeah. neurologically. So there's a different ways you can play around. And the yeah. big one which we always emphasize, another one is uh, plyometrics in water. Okay. So the few studies which have shown that the power gains are similar, both okay. on water as well as land. So That's for cool. patients whom you're a bit wary of introducing plyometrics, we always start in the water and see the response. Usually the response is usually the 24 hours later. Yeah. They come back with the knee swelling or the tendon pain, then you know that it's not right. So mm -hmm. start with aqua, aqua jogging or aqua based plyometrics. Mm -hmm. See the response. Yeah. And then injury. So it's knowing those ways where you can work around their injury and the pain levels. Yeah. Uh, so you're still getting some gains, yeah. but there's there's no substitute for land-based training yeah. and doing a proper strength and conditioning. So yeah. eventually, I'll have to get them to do you know your land-based exercises yeah. to get good form and things like that. Yeah. And that just you know that kind of introduces challenges that you might find with strength training, like the pain and stuff. So there are the so sort of what are the common challenges you find when you're implementing like an SNC type program with runners. So I think one of the key problems is, is volume, just training volume overall. You know, so if you get a, a keen runner in this, that is running six, seven days a week and they have an overuse injury, then just adding in two days of strength training on top of that program mm -hmm. isn't going to give them much benefit there really. You're just putting more load into an already you know, overloaded program. Mm -hmm. um, so one of, the, one of the key barriers I think is getting them to reduce their volume to incorporate the strength and conditioning. And then you come across a lot of the kind of views of oh, I'm going to get bulky I'm going to get big it's going to slow me down you know and and in actual fact I'm yet to see a runner incorporate strength an endurance runner incorporate strength and conditioning and put on a noticeable amount of muscle bulk so uh, it doesn't seem to work that way with endurance running it doesn't seem to um, allow that hypertrophy to occur um, if they're running over a certain mileage per week um, so it's getting them to adapt their volume so that they can incorporate it is, is one thing um, convenience is another thing a lot of them aren't members of gyms you know so uh, that they run because they, they don't like being cooped up in gym so they go outside and run um, so you know it's inconvenient to try and expect them to go and join a gym just specifically to do that mm -hmm. um, some will you know some will happily do that particularly if they're not running at that point in time because then as, as Ben mentioned you can get them to not just do strength and conditioning but they can do a bit of rowing or cross training or swimming in the same facility um, but if they're not able to do that if they don't live there busy work schedule etc then um, as we mentioned before getting them to have options at home um, is the way around that. Mm. So uh, they're the two main barriers that we see is a, a fear of some kind of negative effect of the strength training, uh, overloaded training program where it's not going to be appropriate to add it in 
um, and a lack of convenience to be able to train in gyms or have the time to do that. Awesome. One thing I would add mm. is, as therapists, is to try to k- uh, keep them running as much as possible. Yeah. So there are certain s- circumstances which we go through is things like stress fractures, things like that. Then obviously you have to stop them. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the runners, I would say 90% of the runners, we try to keep them running. Mm. Uh, so because uh, runners get that buzz from running, mm. so you can always stick it on. So yep. if somebody says they get pain after 40 minutes of running, keep it 15, 20 minutes. Mm. So bring it down to three days. So it's always finding ways around it because yeah. the patients will be happier. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, they're more likely to engage in that. Mm. So one one thing which we find a lot of runners complain is, oh, I'm going to go to physio, he's going to ask me to stop running. Yeah. So we don't want to have that create an image. Yeah, I mean, well, in actual fact, I get a lot of um, runners come through my door that have seen uh, several physios beforehand. And um, that seems to be a standard practice for a lot of people. It's just, okay, you're not running now mm. until we kind of finish treatment, you know. And for people that have uh, invested a lot of time and effort and raised money for charities and stuff, that's not really an option, you know. Yeah. And, and if you can facilitate it and re- recover, and they can recover while still maintaining a bit of running in their program, then that's always optimal. Yeah. It's much makes my job much harder if they've stopped running for two, three months to then get them back to where they were at beforehand. Yeah. You know, so it doesn't take very long before all of a sudden then they'll start presenting with new pains and mm. new issues when they start going to return back to their pre-injury um, activity. You might have solved one problem and more often than not you haven't even solved that problem, you've mm-hmm. just offloaded it and when they run it comes back. Yeah. But even if you don't, you put, you're reducing their envelope of function by stopping them running for prolonged periods of time. Yeah. And then by the time they get back to, to running, they, they're more likely to present with other issues as well. Yeah, and often they just won't listen to physios that say don't run and they'll do it up anyway, so it's one of those things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my my um, outcomes improved um, exponentially when I started getting much more involved in their program, in their yeah. running program. So yeah. before when I first started, uh, I had a strength and conditioning kind of approach, uh, which I still incorporate with most of them, um, but I didn't really get involved with their running. You know, I was like, okay, you're a runner, you deal with that, I'll deal with yeah. this, maybe rest a little bit, you know, very mm-hmm. vague advice. Whereas now, I, uh, with particularly with my marathon runners, I'm, I'm sort of really involved with their programs, and I normally yeah. will set their programs if they're turning up to me injured, and I'll, I'll guide them along. Yeah. That's where my um, practice has changed dramatically is um, linking up with running coaches and things like that as well. Yeah. So if they're willing to put that extra effort in, then we can we can work together if they've, if they've got specific times in mind. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, my my success rate with treating running injuries went up dramatically when I sort of taking control of their running really yeah yeah and and that's kind of sort of about change of practice so have you you know has your practice changed a lot yeah years? so something which is unique which I've really incorporated is uh, taking the multiple roles uh, which Glenn was alluding here mm-hmm. suppose you are a footballer coming with groin pain was like treat you give you some high-end rehab but I'm never going to show you how to kick a ball that's I think it's not my area I won't give you sc- uh, football specific skills mm-hmm. so usually I'll give it to the trainer there but where it comes interesting with the runners is we take the whole uh, uh, all the area so I see my role just not as a rehab therapist mm-hmm. but also as a coach yeah. So I'm massively involved in the training program, mm-hmm. the recovery. So I think I look at the all facets because many runners might not have access to a nutritionist, to an assessing coach. So you might be the only person who would be giving them advice on the recovery, the shoes and all those things. So it's having that all around view of a runner, mm-hmm. not just, okay, I'm just going to show you some exercises. That's it. So yeah. that's not where you're going to finish with the runner. Mm-hmm. You're not going to keep that sort of link there. So looking at the whole package, uh, treat the massive as your client for a running coach. Obviously, I'm not a running coach. I'm not really having that high level uh, knowledge there. But for an injured runner, mm. I think we can manage really well yep. to get them back into that normal phase. Mm-hmm. If they want to improve their performance, I will say it's not my area. Yep. Please find a running coach. But most injured patients, we can manage really well. So that holistic view and also looking into the recovery is quite you know undervalued. So looking into the next day, how they're in a muscle soreness. So we use a lot of simple apps we use with the clients. To monitor the recovery because mm-hmm. your training should be based if you want to train like a pro athlete you should recover like a pro athlete isn't mm-hmm. it yeah. you can't just pick up random programs and we're still mm-hmm. working 70 hours yeah. it's not possibly possible so the recovery is hugely important the last thing is actually gait analysis so we quite fortunately we have access to the you know uh, treadmill here so nearly all the patients we like to see them mm-hmm. not necessarily we're going to make changes there so I think it's a logical progression there mm-hmm. if you, you especially when somebody's getting back after an injury yeah. we always want to see them 
uh, and we're giving more em- emphasis on the running mechanics. So that's I think is really change, and that's also being reflected in our courses as well. Is yeah. getting a more holistic view uh, rather than just strength and conditioning, yeah. uh, which is just not the way to go forward. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, you know we've talked about it, or we've both talked about it a little bit, but gait analysis and how important that is. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that in terms of the importance of not only just the strength and stuff, but also the gait analysis stuff as well. I mean, you have to be mindful of the drawbacks of gait analysis. You know, when we're looking at someone on a treadmill and they only ever run outside, there's an obvious issue there, isn't there? Mm. So does that reflect how they run uh, on the road, you know, when we've got them on the treadmill? But on the same note, um, I don't have the um, time to go out with them on the road and film them and all that sort of stuff. So it's the best option available in the clinic Mm. um, to get a look at what they're doing, which is running, you know? So as I said, if someone was getting pain when they was turning to the right, I would watch them turn to the right and yeah. see if there's anything jumping out from there. Um, we can make some assumptions by the way they single leg squat. If they're going into a valgus, they'll probably go into a valgus on the treadmill. We know that's been shown. Um, but until you actually see it, uh, you can't make those assumptions again. And so there's been a few a few issues around the gait analysis that have um, been a major player in I think our course development, our practice. So um, I used to. I used to do gait analysis eight, nine years ago, and it was a real a real hassle, you know, to use a camera and download it on a PC and go through it. I had to allow an extra half hour on top of an already extended session. Um, whereas now it's so simple, you can do it with apps that we go through on iPads, you know, it's, it's very quick. Um, so I think it's become much more accessible for everyone. It used to be that um, you could only really get a look at uh, 2D, you know, like for side and back, or maybe from the front if you wanted mm-hmm. to do that. Uh, you didn't have any real idea of what impact forces was going through uh, your client. You know, maybe you'd listen to the sound that they were making on the treadmill. Mm-hmm. Whereas now there's some there's some pretty good kit available that you can you can uh, that's quite reliable that you can use in real time again, and you can download it and see actually what's their ground reaction force, what is it on the left, what is it on the right. You know, so mm-hmm. we're working with a few companies that are uh, you know developing that side of things. So it's developing and it's it's progressing. I don't think it's a passing fad. I think it's mm. you know it's something that we should all be um, proficient in doing yep. if we're dealing with runners. Um, we have to be aware of the limitations on the same note as mm. that, you know. But if someone's a runner, you want to watch them run. Yeah. Uh, you get an idea of of, rough, of what they're doing, uh, and they get confidence in you that you you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. you know? So I yeah. think it's a kind of this it's, it's a win win really. Cool. Um, yeah. And I think what running by mechanic, mechanics is a huge area, so it can really get complex with so many areas. But yeah. what we emphasize on the course is complex thinking but simple intervention. So when you retrain with your patients, you don't have to really go into all this in depth. You know? So mm-hmm. give them simple cues, you know, uh, like for example, like if you want to improve hip extension, like push the track back or you squash an orange. So like we use very simple three, four words cues, mm-hmm. uh, which is more relative to the patient. And generally we use more external cues mm-hmm. uh, rather than thinking about the pelvis and hips and things like mm-hmm. that something they can uh, listen to or something like that yeah. so uh, it's simplifying by mechanics yeah. and making it accessible to the patient yeah. uh, because you can really get bogged down to all the sort of vector forces and things like that mm. which is not really important isn't it yeah. I think that's the only way that clinically it's going to um, translate into their running isn't it if you're walk, if, you, if you're having to concentrate and think then you're not going to be able to incorporate a cue yeah. I think that's a really important point the mm-hmm. cues need to be simple and you know we've discussed quite a lot here today uh, but again it's, it's layered isn't it it's like um, when I first started I got lots of success with my runners just by incorporating a good strength and conditioning program which mm. most of them have never done and you realise that that's not the, the be on end all that's, that's an important part of, of a program that most runners are missing yeah. Uh, then I started looking more at the volume. Oh, okay, these guys are running seven days a week. These guys are running three days a week. The ones running seven seem to be getting injured more. And then the evidence supports that. You know, if you don't have your two rest days a week, then your injury rate is is significantly more. So, yeah. you know, f- when you're starting out looking at runners, if it's uh, something you're new to, just by getting them to run three days a week and two days strength and conditioning, it's going to have a positive effect for most of your amateur runners. You mm-hmm. know that um, I saw my success rate, I always audit my marathon runners, how many actually come on the books and how many finish. Mm-hmm. And just that was the biggest spike that I've seen in improvement there, just mm-hmm. managing volume. Now the issue there is then if they want to get a sub three hour marathon or something, if they're a bit more advanced, they're not going to do that with that program. So yeah. that's when you need to, to um, incorporate the help of coaches or take a bit more of an involved role yourself. Yeah. But I think you know there's lots of simple changes you can make. And 
and as Ben said when you start looking at a running very simple cues looking at their cadence things that you can quite easily change with external cues it doesn't have to be overly complex and then as you do more and more and you see more and more you can add more and more to those layers and then mm. um, yeah, eventually you can be at a point where you are taking on those free rolls. You know? yeah. And it depends on where they come from. If you've got a simple 5k run, a 10k run, you don't have to maybe be complex. Mm. Whereas I might treat a marathon run a bit, bit more uh, in depth. So it's knowing as somebody who just runs three times a week, 20 minutes, park run, mm. you don't have to be more complex on that. You know? yeah. Just manage a volume, a decent program is enough. Yeah. Whereas with a marathon runner, you're going to go in more complexity. Mm. Yeah. So the level they're training and also the experience. So somebody who has done multiple marathons, uh, you're going to really take that into account as well. The experience matters usually. Yeah. Yeah. So not it's not a homogeneous group. Yeah. So not everybody needs to be in depth as well. So there are a few people where you don't need to look at the weight analysis. Right? You can just do that. Just because we have that, we have a look. But sometimes it's a great reassurance for the patient as well. Yeah. So they feel like it's good. It's like you know they've been validated. Yeah. and sort of uh, improves their compliance as well. You know? mm-hmm. uh, nearly all of it, all my runners love to be videoed and show yeah. what's how they do. Yeah. It's just a human yeah, nature, I isn't it? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll video most. I will probably only change the running styles of maybe 30% or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. if that. You know? So a lot of yeah. the time you're just looking, okay, is that relevant? Maybe not. You know? uh, and then, yeah. But again, anything, there's a big drive towards just hands off everything exercise in physio at the moment with everyone isn't it but anything that can improve the compliance to them doing your exercises yeah it's got to be useful in my Definitely. eyes as yeah. well yeah, yeah. there's a massive benefit to that if you're saying oh that looks like this could benefit from a bit of strength exercises here and there they, they're hopes they're going to buy into yeah. that yeah. as opposed to just you know your opinion yeah, yeah definitely Awesome. So, um, so obviously you do the courses for other physios and stuff. So, where would people go if they want to get if yeah. they want to get involved in the courses? Or yeah, so we're doing quite a bit of courses. We're covering about ten countries uh, this year. Mm-hmm. So, uh, we're doing. I think next one is South Africa. I think we're doing yeah, running course in Johannesburg and yeah. Cape Town. Uh, I think we're going to Dublin. We have to check our uh, diary. So, I think all the details are on function to fitness slash courses. Mm-hmm. So, I think the key thing which we try to uh, bring on our courses is having a systematic approach to dealing with. Uh, com- complex uh, multifactorial running injuries mm-hmm. and also encompass the whole uh, interventions starting from simple rehab exercises to strength and conditioning yeah. taking them all the way to power exercise plyometrics dynamic mobility yeah. and finally like the icing on the cake uh, is gait analysis so yeah. that has definitely has a role so yeah. it's a lot of skills uh, which we go through that's why it takes two days mm-hmm. so that's something who wants to take it's like a journey, isn't it? Mm. Starting from the initial injury mm-hmm. and getting them back. And runners quickly forget how bad they were initially. And yeah. they talk about performance and things like that. So uh, most, you know, we've been doing it for six years and it's going from strength to strength. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we hope to see uh, uh, you over there. Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Thanks, guys.